and I'm sitting with Dr. Donald Freeman of the School of International Training in Brattlesboro, Vermont. Brattleboro. Brattleboro. Oh, there's Brattleboro, no Brattleboro, S. Vermont. No S. Yeah. And uh, of course, he's quite well known for a number of books that he's published and things that he's done around the community, uh, journal publishings. And I discovered last year, and I've been dying to ask, since I ran into uh, looks like a husband and wife couple with the name Freeman working out of California. David and Yvonne. No, no, I have a brother named David, but it's not that David. Yeah. Oh, so it's a different yeah. David. Yeah. They're doing some interesting stuff on content-based instruction, yes. which is one of my interest areas. Right. So. Yeah. No. No. They're 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 very. Their work is very well known um, in the states, and particularly in California. Yeah, it looks yeah. like their their primary focus is the ESL secondary yeah. school classroom. Yeah, I think that's true. And uh, so let's see. Well, tell us a little bit about SIT. It's got quite a reputation in Korea for uh, people who get there and do the two summer program, and a few people who get there for a one year for full right. term, right. both for the the TESOL program and the culture program. Yeah. Well. Um, SIT does have a number of uh, Korean students. Uh, we have actually a, a quite multinational student body of about uh, 250 MA students only. We only only enroll master's students in one of two uh, graduate faculties, one in language education, which is the one that I'm in, and the other in intercultural service leadership and management. And uh, the the thing, there are a couple things that make sort of SIT unlike other institutions. One, it's a it's a freestanding graduate school, uh, accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges as a division of an NGO or non-governmental organization. So our parent organization is basically uh, a, an education and development NGO that works for uh, strengthening peace and social justice around the world, and we're the graduate division of that organization. There's also an exchange division, and there's also a rather large projects division that's based in Washington, D.C. that does uh, international project work. Yeah. We're going to take a minute or two here to discuss a few things to give some of our overseas guests a chance to come in online, um, and so I'd like to, to talk a little bit more about the MATSO program there. It's uh, it's got a couple of interesting and perhaps not entirely uh, loved by SIT reputations in Korea. Um, one is that it is heavy, heavy into the uh, cultural understanding aspects, mm -hmm. which makes sense for an EFL environment, but it makes it quite distinctive from most of the other ELT graduate school type programs in America that are so heavily into ESL teach in America. Right. Well, I think, I think the reason that we um, are perceived as having an emphasis on, on intercultural communication and understanding really goes back to the roots of the organization, which was founded as an international exchange organization in the 1930s. And SIT itself was the original training center for U.S. Peace Corps. And uh, those values of sort of uh, interpersonal commitment to uh, improving uh, the environments in which you, you live and work have really continued to be central. And so it's, it's very difficult to have a, a campus of about 200 students from about 40 different countries unless you spend a substantial amount of time really working for people to have deep understandings of one another and not just sort of let's eat together in the dining hall and go back to the lecture hall and ignore what are the more troublesome aspects of what may be different about us. And the other thing that SIT is particularly well known for is a very strong emphasis on the reflective aspects yes. of teaching as a profession and education as a reflective process mm -hmm. both during the formal MAT uh, degree as well as later pro continuing professional right. development and, and, and it's got a nickname which is not entirely fair right. uh, what was it was it Naval Gazing University right. because it's yeah. so introspective it's right. got the, the kind of the, the Buddha figure right. Uh, right. perception right. in Korea and I, I think that that's a that's that's very positive, but it also can sometimes be perceived as a weakness for somebody who thinks uh, the academics is less solid. How do you address that kind of a? Well, I think it's I, I think what you're saying. Uh, I appreciate your candor in that view. Um, is based on a number of, of misconceptions. Um, introspection and reflection are not one and the same, and certainly reflection is not the same as uh, what I would call navel gazing. Um, reflection is essentially, I think, a, a, a technology, if you will, to examine 
what you're doing and how it squares with what you think you're doing and whether the impact that you're having is the one that you think you're, you're, you're having. So it's fundamentally a cybernetic process, no different than an elevator door closing and hitting on you and opening and then closing again when there's nothing in the way. It's a very human process. When you go across the street, you look if there's any traffic, you step out. If there is traffic, you don't. That's a reflective process. So the notion that it somehow gets interpreted to mean sort of more, uh, um, more of a, a sort of a meditative quality is probably a frosting that's put on it on, on the core value. The other thing that I think is important is that one of the enduring problems in teacher education is the notion that there is a knowledge base that you learn it and you know it and then you do it. And of course that, as you were just saying about this webcast, I mean, four years ago the speed was one thing, now it's, it's a di different thing. That, that speed of change in technology or in anything in our lives is, is extremely uh, dramatic and very clear. If you're in a professional pre preparation program that doesn't engage with that notion that basically what you're learning is going to be out of date uh, and doesn't equip you with a way to address that rigorously and think about that rigorously, I'd suggest that whatever education you're getting is probably only giving you a third of what you need to know. And I'd like to point out that, mm -hmm. that I wanted to present exactly yeah. what, you hear. What, what, yeah. what can be heard. Sure. Um, on the other hand, if we look at most of the contemporary graduate schools today, they are going more and more towards reflection. Sure. The idea of comprehensive final examinations mm -hmm. is going away. Yep. Uh, and personal journals, teaching journals, uh, portfolios mm -hmm. are coming in. And reflections is becoming a required part of that portfolio. Yep. What are you doing? What do you think you're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, look at what you did, and how do you think about what you did? Exactly, and how do you know? I mean, it's. It, I mean, the other thing that I think is different about the perception of reflection in that way is that it is. I mean, to go back to our earlier discussion before we went live, um, it is fundamentally a database activity. I mean, it, reflection is an OG. I, I think my students got something out of this. How do you know that? What, what's your information? What are you basing that on? Um, where are, you, where are you drawing your information from? And that sort of rigor in considering what the source of your information is and how you know what you know is, I think, a central part not only of professional practice as a teacher, but it's also, I think, of being a human being. I mean, it's interesting, the educational philosopher John Dewey, uh, who was a Vermonter, um, w is really considered by many to be the father of reflective practice as it's known now in current modern educational circles. And there were there are a wonderful set of letters that are exchanged between John Dewey and Dr. Donald Watt, who was a Quaker physician who founded the experiment, our parent organization in the 30s, about the nature of learning from experience and what does it mean to learn from experience and how do you do that. And I think fundamentally what Dewey was saying in those letters was that in order for a, de a democratic society to build itself, people always have to be examining whether they're getting what they think they're getting, they're learning what they think they're learning and doing what they think they need to do. Uh, we have questions that are coming in. I just wanted to, to ask you for a quick three-minute overview of your presentation earlier this weekend for some of our folks who may not have been able to see that. Can you do a three-minute overview? Just hit the highlights without... Uh, yeah, without with all, all, all the details. Um, I was talking about the notion of attention that exists in any classroom, language classroom, any classroom, between uh, the teacher's intention, what, what she, and I'll use the feminine pronoun for the teacher, what she wants to achieve, and the student's expectations, in other words, what they think they're there to get or to do. And that that's, I, I call that a basic balancing act that exists in any, any classroom. And the aim is to try to engineer, if you will, an overlap between what the teacher wants and what the students want. Or if we put it in more common terms, between classroom management, which is the way the teacher sort of exercises what she wants, and classroom participation, which is the way the students, sort of the public face of how they exercise what they want. And so by finding that common ground between management and participation, what we really need, are trying to do is to understand what needs to go into that equation, if you will, to get the balance right. Then I turn to talk about a project that we've been doing through the Center for Teacher Education Training and Research at SIT that was um, uh, inaugurated by McGraw-Hill to look at that issue of balance between manage and participation in the context of large classes where course books were the primary form of curriculum. And we ran an online uh, research project for about two months in which we had eight 
teachers slash trainers, people who worked with teachers in supported development capacities in six different countries, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Mexico, Brazil, and Turkey. And we led them through a process of essentially describing what we called uh, are the sort of the breakdown and repair strategies in the use of, of course books in large classrooms. What we were looking at is how breakdown fun is a function of intention and expectation. From that, we gleaned a sort of a set of principles uh, about what seems to go on when things work well and what seems to be missing when they're not. And the interesting thing about it is it's like almost anything in life. When things go well, you know, you don't miss the water till the well runs dry. When it, when it works, nobody even notices it because it's working. It's when it's not working that it's most evident. So there's simple things like, for example, um, setup is key. And, and, you know, we know this in large classes, we know it in any class, that everybody really needs to know what they're doing. And it doesn't mean just that you need to tell them what they're doing. They need to understand it and, and know what it is. And there are other principles like that. But that, that's a little bit more than a three-minute synopsis. Okay, I understand we have a question. Can we read the question and also where the question is coming from? Your question, Dr. Freeman, is coming in from China. And the question is, please elaborate more on the statement... What you do is shaped by where you do it and who you do it with. Certainly. I use that statement as sort of the, what I call the punchline or the jumping off of the talk and then we came back to it at the end. Um, there are a couple pieces to that statement. Um, what you do in the sense of an activity is shaped obviously by where you do it. You're not going to play tennis in the middle of a subway station. You're not going to wait for a train on a tennis court. So venue creates activity and vice versa. I mean, those are sort of trivial examples. The more complicated piece of it is it's not only shaped by where you do it, but who you do it with and how you're expected to do it. And so that it is the other participants in the environment and how they do what they do that shapes what your capacity is. So if we think about it in the context of a language classroom, the work of, for example, Tim Murphy from formerly Taiwan, now Japan, uh, on near-peer work is an example of that. Uh, Tim spends a lot of time in his large classes having students work very closely on joint activities with the Vygotskyan concept essentially that by working with someone that's close to you in level you actually are going to advance your capacity in the language. That's an illustration of this concept of what you do being shaped by who you do it with. Does that concept affect the ability to, to use what some people are calling um, authentic activities in a non-authentic environment, that being the classroom? Yeah, well, well, certainly one of the, if I'm understanding your question, one of the pieces that is key here is probably a recognition, uh, as Mark Helgeson was saying earlier today, that classrooms are screwy places, that they are unlike anything else. And so to pretend that a language classroom can be like a non-language classroom is... Uh, is probably not a polite <laughs> fiction. Yeah, yes. it's a polite. Yeah, exactly, it's a polite and rehearsed professional fiction. So the notion really is that in a classroom, what you need to be doing is to structure learning in such a way that people are working with other learners that are at or slightly above their level to to sort of stretch where their capacity is. And so therefore it does suggest that a lot more dyad or pair work is more effective, for example, than group repetition. Group repetition is really nothing more than sort of letting your mouth go. Um, working in a dyad forces you at least to engage with one other person. The large classroom. A dyad or a pair. Right, right. Yeah. The, the right. large classroom is a reality here in in East Asia, China. Korea, Japan, and some of the other places who have pledged to be with us this weekend, such as uh, Saudi Arabia. Mm. Adding to that can be the issue of, well, certain teachers like to work with seating charts, or even there is a classroom culture where students sit in the same seat all the time, right. and uh, that may be based on, on a attendance roster. Mm -hmm. And the seats may be bolted to the floor, so we get right. these real problems of, of creating dynamic pair work or, or changing peers, getting the, the, the near peer environment, or one person says, well, I'm always working with somebody who's a step below me. When do I get to work with right. somebody who's better right. than me? Right. 
this can be a real challenge. It can, and I mean, I think all the things you're elaborating are very real and non-trivial uh, concerns. But part of what I was talking about yesterday and what I think is key in thinking about participation in the sociocultural context, which is the more theoretical way of saying what you do is shaped by who you do it with and where you do it, is the fact that as a teacher, if I put as much attention on who's doing what with whom as I do on what the lesson is about, I will probably achieve as good or better results in terms of student learning than if I emphasize simply the content. So to take your example of being locked into one partner and not moving around, I used the example in my talk yesterday of some work that was done by uh, two researchers at, at Harvard back in the early 90s, Courtney Kasten and Sarah Michaels, where they looked at the introduction of word processing into um, elementary school classrooms with fourth grade students, 10-year-old students. And in, in one classroom, what they did was they gave, gave the kids in both classrooms a real simple 10-item test. And bear in mind, this is 10, 12 years ago, so word processing was fairly uncommon particularly at the elementary level, things like cutting and pasting and you know very basic things, beginning of the year, end of the year. Classroom A, as I said in my plenary, what the teacher, the teacher had a, a habit of having students work in pairs or groups, and so they would come up and work at the computer and go back to their other stuff. But she didn't ever force them to mix the groups up, your example of always having the same partner. Teacher B also had people working in groups constantly, but every month, she scrambled the groups. And so every month she had a different seating chart and people had to move around. So I posed the question to people, which of those two classrooms, A or B, do you think most of the students became proficient at word processing? And the answer is? Probably B. Probably B. It was B. And most definitely. Because essentially what the teacher was doing is orchestrating the di distribution of knowledge in the classroom. So if you take a large classroom with the seats that are boiled, bo boiled bolted down and the need to really have a, a sort of an organized seating chart, and you as a teacher say, okay, I commit to changing the seating once a month, my hunch, which is, I think, substantiated by a fair amount of, of uh, research, is that actually you're going to end up with better overall results in your class than if you just say, oh, this is too much of a hassle, I'm not going to attend to it. So in other words, it's an incremental thing. It doesn't have to be a major thing like, you know, we're going to change every week and move people around constantly. We have uh, teachers who move students change partners in arbitrary fashions. We have people who like to work with these kinds of chains where you you adjust every so often to the next person on the list. Right. We have people who give their, their learners complete freedom in choosing their partner right. and how often they, they rotate. How do these factors affect the concept of a, of a participatory learning practice? Right. Well, it's, you're asking a really interesting question because what you've caught there is sort of two meanings of participation. One that I would call sort of volu the voluntary aspect of participation. Who do you want to work with? Who do you, you know, who's your best friend? Who's, who's, who's the partner you want to be with? And there's certainly a lot to recommend that. I mean, it's a lot easier to do work with somebody you want to do it with than somebody that you don't want to do it with. And similarly, if it's project-based or some kind of uh, something that actually calls on us to jointly create something, Having to do it when they're interpersonal issues and we don't get along is probably not very productive. That's one level of participation. There's another level, which is this distributed knowledge level, mm -hmm. which basically says any two heads, when put together, are going to produce more than one separately. So under that second meaning, it is actually pretty critical that you don't leave it up to the first meaning of total volunteerism because you won't get the level of, of shuffling of the deck that you need you, you need to get. Now that said, there are lots of ways of doing it. You know, I, mean, teacher, I know teachers who say, okay, every two weeks you've got to find you've got to work with a new person. You can choose who that is, but you just you know can't be the person you've worked with right. in the last two or three weeks. That's sort of guaranteeing some amount of, of, of shaking things up without diminishing the voluntary aspect of it. But you're looking at rotations in a allowing partners to work together for a longer period of time at that point. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, there are a lot of factors that go into this, but the fundamental notion is that um, knowledge is not individual, but it is social or distributed. And so in order to get that distribution better, you got to shuffle the deck. Do you have any other questions at the moment coming in? Sure. Oh, we have an on-site question. <laughs> Um, Dr. Freeman, I'm just wondering, a, a lot of the, the concepts that you're talking about in terms of relational learning and, and uh, reflective learning, I'm fully in agreement with. Um, I'm curious about how you feel using technology in the classroom 
relates to uh, reflective learning and relational learning. Um, Can you say a little bit more about what's behind your verb reflect or relates to? I mean, what, you mean that there might I'm not actually, be a connection? No, actually, I, my own feeling is that there is, and I see it sort of in the in the sense that uh, both using technology, particularly right. internet technology in the classroom, also to an extent takes the teacher out of the traditional role right. um, and sometimes can encourage different kinds of communication between learners. Right. Um, and I just was wondering if you might be able to talk right. a little bit right. about your perspective on well, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I should say up front that I am not uh, terribly technologically dexterous, as was demonstrated yesterday as we were trying to get the uh, the um, the PowerPoint to work. That said, though, I, I think I've been more and more convinced by uh, actually the value of technology when it functions as a means to an end and not an end in itself in in in, in teaching and learning environments. And certainly, I mean, there 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 are lots of examples of of that um, uh, use of, of of email or electronic uh, uh, communication in large classes is a way that um, I think can really bring out some students that are less likely to be brought out uh, possibly orally but would be uh, in, in a more written medium. The same I think goes for work that involves collaborative development of websites or, or uh, things of that nature. What I'm struck most by is that when the technology um, in, enhances or facilitates the participants ability to do what it is that he or she wants to do, it seems to sort of flow like water. When it becomes a barrier that you have to get over in order to do what you want to do, it gets in the way. And let, let me give an example. Not yeah, it, well, it starts as being intimidating and it ends up, I think, as just being a flat sort of um, non-event, you know, so you don't, you don't want to go into it. But an example I would give, which is from professional development, uh, we, we do a number, we do work in a project called the Teacher Knowledge Project uh, at uh, SIT, which works with professional development, primarily in, with American public school teachers, although we're about to start in a very major effort in West Africa, in Mali, working in 800 secondary schools doing reflective practice, which will be quite an amazing uh, thing. Teacher knowledge calls on teachers to be able to talk to each other about what's going on in their classrooms. Teachers' lives are packed. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, your life is, is very busy from morning to leave, evening. When do you get time to sit down with other people and talk? It's hard to do that, and that becomes a major inhibitor. Technology allows for that to happen when those groups function or meet online. What we found is when we run inquiry seminars online, teachers participate even more than they do when they have the opportunity to do it in a face-to-face -face environment. And even among teachers who are self-avowed non-technology folks, I mean, this is not their first love, what's drawing them to it is the fact that they want to be able to interact with their peers around the issues that they care about. And so I think that that's a very salutary message, which is if you get the, the end right, the means will take care of itself. I think that that pulls into one of the questions I was going to raise is in in general teachers are now being asked to fill a new role yes uh, we've we've had we've gone from the original uh, provider of knowledge to we could say in the in the 60s and 70s in North America in particular they became the uh, the substitute parent the yeah. source of of a role model in society, perhaps they've always had that, but it became more to the to the forefront. But nowadays, in particularly in countries like Korea, teachers are being told, "You have to do research. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, publish in some way." Mm -hmm. And we may argue about what publishing is and how traditional it has to be. But you have to do this, or else there will be no further professional advancement. You won't become a, a vice principal of a, of a public school. You, you will not have a chance to get a tenure-type position at a university. Well, that's always kind of been the case, except in the ELT area. Yeah. Maybe there was yeah. some flexibility. But now they're saying that you have to, you have to get the higher-level degree, and you have to publish, and you still have to maintain your quite heavy teaching load. Right. And, oh, and by the way, since we have technology, we can now require you to put in more time yeah. on that level. Yeah. Teachers don't have enough hours in the day. No, absolutely. And something's got to give. I mean, I think uh, the issue, 
the 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 issue of of um, sort of the research component uh, that's being demanded of teachers. It sort, of, sort of functions, I think, in a number of ways. One, the positive side is really saying, essentially, as a classroom practitioner, you're involved in the use and the generation of knowledge, and so making that public is part of your responsibility. And that's a value that I hold. We were talking about uh, the book that I did on teacher research, which that's a core, core idea in that book. The problem is when the notion of research is based on a higher education view or a view of someone for whom research is a full-time undertaking. It clearly can't fit with somebody whose full-time undertaking is classroom teaching. So therefore something has to give. And my concern has been, and I think this goes back to our, our discussion, that typically what is given is that teachers have been told that what they do is inferior. It's not the same quality research because it doesn't meet the sort of same standards of rigor and, and design that, that research normally would be held to. And, and therefore it can't be published in a proper journal Absolutely. and, and yeah. oh yes, a teacher's newsletter doesn't count. Right. Uh, you have to publish, we're not sure what you have to publish in, but but it's not that. Right, right. Uh, just to, I know we've got a question, and I just want to wind up this thought. So the issue for me is really how we define research in the context of teaching, and second, how we define the kinds of genres or forms of representation that research should take. And a very, a very interesting example of the genre question is um, a group that is probably one of the two longest standing teacher research groups in the United States, the, Philate the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Teacher Research Group, that represents their findings through a form of reader's theater that, that, that participants, uh, uh, participating research teachers uh, um, enact. The value of that reader's theater, and I've seen it enacted at, in, in the halls of high educational research, is that it is so compelling and faithful to the environments in which the work is done that you can't, you can't overlook it. It's far more compelling than a research report in a, in a referee journal. That said, I think the lesson underlying that is finding the right form or genre to represent the knowledge that you're, you're developing. We have a yeah. question coming in. Yeah. Please read the, the place and the question. Sure. Um, this question is also from IAT, IA TEFL China. And uh, their question also relates to the idea of demands on teachers. Uh, this, in this case, exams, and I think particularly standardized exams. And the question is, using whom you do it with and when, how can we prepare students for meeting the demands of the exams? Um, please, rec please reconcile sort of this, uh, this perspective or this approach with the demands of curriculum. That, that's a very good, a very good and, and, and better question for you than I. Yeah, exactly. I know. Isn't this where we say now we'll take a short break and we'll be right back? Um, uh, there was a problem with technology, and I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> no, seriously, what you're talking about is a very real aspect of, of the teaching and learning that, that, that we're involved in. And I think understanding how to address those demands of, of, of standardized exams and standardized forms of accountability with the kind of view that, that I've been talking about uh, of, of sociocultural practice is key. I guess I would say a couple things. First of all, my sense, and it is again borne out by work of others as well as my own, is that part of the, the, the obstacle to addressing the demands of exams is that it is too risky to do anything different than what you've already done. Put another way, that let's say you go in tomorrow and you say, you know, I've been doing it this way, I've been having great results, but tomorrow I'm going to do it in a totally different way and I just hope it'll work out as well. That's almost an ethical position to take because you're you're toying with your students' lives. Exactly, their future, and especially here where the, where the the test determines whether they get into a good university, whether they get a good job. It, Thirty, right. forty years downstream right. has an impact. Right, and so that means one of two things: that it, because I think we would agree that it is unethical to sort of make wholesale change and hope that you get the same results that you've gotten beforehand, you have to look at something much more like incremental change. If you think about incremental change, then we go to the notion that we were saying earlier about seating and participation. If you say, look, it's not about I'm going to throw out the seating chart and let people sit wherever they want to. I'm simply going to say every two weeks that you have to move one seat to the right, so you're going to end up working with someone different. That's an incremental change that I would hold is uh, an ethical risk to take that probably will have 
uh, no negative impact and probably would have a positive impact. So put in a broader way, the way I would answer the question is what one has to do in this kind of situation is to look at the changes that one can make incrementally while bearing in mind what the outcome needs to be, as opposed to sort of throwing everything out and trying to start all over again. And in an action research model, Absolutely. you're going to have feedback before you get to the next two-week cycle. You'll know whether you've, right, right. you've made an egregious error or whether things are transitioning right, fairly close right. to plan. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to point out that you are also uh, a past president of TESOL Incorporated, TESOL right. International. Right. And that's important. Korea TESOL is a TESOL affiliate, as are many of our right. members. Uh, yet the question comes up regularly, and, and sometimes I ask myself as well, uh, as an international member, what am I getting out of this? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's 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 try to do TESOL in two minutes, and then we'll move okay, to, and to a new your question about TESOL. Uh, as an international member, right? Uh, how do how do I fit in? You know, right, what what right. am I getting out of this? As right. opposed to somebody who's you know, I've never been to a TESOL international conference. Right, right. I'd love to go to Long Beach next year, but you know, money is a factor. Right. Yeah, I you know that that that's a perennial question. I should say sort of up front. You know, I, I it's been more than ten years since I've I've I was uh, on the board of directors and I was president. So I I'm not particularly up to date in the answer to that question. Other than to say that I think there are a, there are a couple ways we have to think about TESOL. One is as a professional association, and the question you're asking sort of pertains to that. The second is TESOL as, as a profession, and the third is sort of TESOL as a field of activity. Uh, TESOL as a profession, I think what you gain is the sense of connection, and Korea Bridge is a perfect example of that. I mean, what you're doing here is extraordinary. And there was a time when professional associations, the first meaning of TESOL, needed to be there for this kind of thing to happen. And in fact, co-TESOL provides the content for which Korea Bridge is the process exactly. of bridging. So I think that's that's a marriage that's very important. So so we need those two things to be there. It isn't so much what you get out of it individually, but how the profession, as broadly put, globally, benefits from the ability to, to, to be connected. The third area, which is TESOL as a field of activity, and that's sort of another discussion, so we should probably go to some of these and, questions. And I should point out that we are working with several forms of question uh, question sources, and from time to time things just pop up and we get surprised. So I'd like to uh, move the mic over to someone who can read some of the questions who have just come in. Uh, these questions are from a gentleman who calls himself West Tokyo. Okay. And we have, uh, we have 20 or 30 people who are watching us in West Tokyo. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, 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 we were of the understanding that 20 or 30 people would be watching us in West Tokyo, but there might not be available till later in the day. Hello, West Tokyo. Okay, so the West Tokyo questions are, if spontane <laughs> sorry, if spontaneity is essential, how can it be programmed into a curriculum? Isn't this an oxymoron? Yes, I'm not sure why I'm being asked. <laughs> um, yes, you can. I don't think you can program spont uh, spontaneity. Um, his second question. If what we do as teachers and students depends on the people and contacts we do it in, what are some specific ways we can go about altering the way we act in our classrooms, given that the people and the rooms stay relatively constant? We, we we did in talking about as sort of the seating patterns is one example. Um, yeah. Okay. So were there others there? You, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah. We've dealt with the second one. Yeah. Uh, well. I think we spoke to it. it we sort of answered yeah. it in the interim before we realized it had come in. Right. I think a couple of those questions may have been set up before the program actually started. Oh. Okay. Well, they, ah. some some questions came in early. So, okay, let's carry on. So, your current research. My current research. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in two things. The first is what is the, um, what is the relationship between um, professional development and teachers work. So if we take the statement that I used in my, my, my talk yesterday, what you do is shaped by where you do it and who you do it with, 
one of the things that's very clear in that relationship is that often people have teachers have the experience of going to a professional development event like cotisol like a conference which takes them out of their workspace they come back energized with new ideas and they sort of hit a wall and they just you know it's sort of almost like the reverse of a hangover you know you sort of wake exactly. up and say oh man why did i think i could do any of this you know and they fall back into those patterns of activity that happens so much that I think we cannot attribute it to a lack of will on the part of the, per of the individual, on a lack of uh, interest or support from the environment, that we really have to go to a deeper level and say, what is the relationship between the participant and the setting? And so in my work, I've been more and more involved in how professional development can interact with school change or institutional change. And particularly with changing this thing that's sort of invisible, which is out there like the air, which is what I would call the culture of teaching and learning in schools. So for example, the center that I direct has just finished a large two-year project in Rio de Janeiro working with a group of 13 schools to change the teaching culture of teaching and learning in those schools through professional development. And it, it's been a very interesting process to look at what is essentially organizational change and professional development in the same way. So that's one strand of what I'm interested in. The other one is what the impact is of professional development on student learning. Because it's something that is very, very much at the fore in the United States right now and in Europe as well, is if we're going to invest in professional development of teachers, we want to know by golly, that students are learning more and better than they were before we invested in this training. And that's been a classic question that has been posed of, of professional development uh, for teachers. Not the kind of going to a conference in your own development, but let's say I'm going to invest as an institution in your training. I want to make sure that people are going to do better. Your students are going to The in-house training. The in-house training or school system training or even national uh, investments in professional development. So that question of what the impact is of professional development on student learning is a very large one. The key issue there is actually what the conceptual relationship is between teaching and learning. Because if we take the basic relationship that is pretty much assumed, which is the teaching causes learning, then we're simply saying if we can make you be a better teacher, we will cause you to cause better and be better improved learning amongst your students. That causal relationship is manifestly not the right conceptual relationship because if that were true, we wouldn't have any problems with professional development and all right. teachers would be improving and students would be learning more and the question we had about standardized exams would go away. But we have the same issue at the reverse, uh, looking at it from the opposite direction. We see more and more uh, evaluations of teachers yes. based on what their students, what their are, students doing. are doing. It's becoming accepted in North America. Yep. It's, uh, in Korea, for example, more and more weight is being given to student evaluation of the teacher right. and also uh, how well the student does on a, on a, a standardized campus test or, or on a TOEIC test, right. or, which may not even be the core of what the teacher is asked Absolutely. to teach. I'm being asked to teach conversation, but I'm being assessed on whether my students added another 35 points to their TOEIC score. Right. Uh, as a profession, as a body of teachers, right. Right. how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, you're right. It's a global issue. It manifests itself in different ways. I think there are a couple pieces to what you're saying. One, one is that... Um, in principle, the fact that my work as a teacher needs to be assessed by its impact on learners seems to me uh, a perfectly valid proposition. Um, the problem becomes when the forms of data gathering don't line up with the teaching that I think I'm doing, as you said. And so in order to achieve that alignment, a couple things have to be true. One is that there needs to be a common view of what's being taught or the curriculum. So in a positive sense, what, for example, the standards movement has done for educational reform in the United States is to set a common frame for what needs to be taught, a, more than teaching to the test, because good standards are, in fact, statements of what the outcome ought to be in the grand plan. Many countries have very good structures of educational standards. New Zealand, Australia, South Africa being three examples of very well articulated sets of educational outcomes at a macro level. When that exists, it becomes easier to develop <coughs> sets of assessments that match that broader outcome 
and therefore that the teacher is trying to achieve those broader outcomes. When those don't exist, you get into this morass where, well, we'll pick one from column A, which is what the assessment will be, and we'll have one from column B, which is what the teacher is doing, and guess what? They don't line up at all until you have a mismatch. So I guess in some what I'm saying, the problem is not relating teaching to learning and through and, and looking at what students have learned as one, one view of what the teacher has accomplished. The problem is having a common view of what the content or outcome ought to be of that teaching and an agreed upon set of assessments. The other thing I'd say, in your example, what's positive is in Korea you mentioned that there are two things. It's sort of the student's assessment and there's the more objective, if you will, standardized test. That's, I think, positive because we know that there are really two kinds of data that you need to get. One is data that would hold up sort of outside the classroom. You know, if you sent the student out on the street, what could he or she what could do? do? Right. The other is that you need to capture that culture of teaching and learning in the classroom through students' reactions and thinking and so on. And too often, I think, in these kinds of causally based assessment relationships, we only go for the first one and we ignore sort of what the, what the, what the culture of teaching and learning feels like. How are we doing for time? Uh, five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes? Okay, let's go with the comment from China. I, Tefl China, would like to invite Dr. Freeman and Korea TESOL colleagues to attend our next year annual conference, which is going to be held on the 24th through 28th of May in Donghua, Jilin, uh, People's Republic of China. Thank you. Well, thank you for the uh, invitation. I was sorry that the conference had to be suspended last year because of the, uh, the problem with SARS, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you about the conference uh, this coming May. And uh, I must say that they're doing a terrific job of publicizing their conference because we've heard from them several times during the course of the day. And uh, we ought to basically do Cotisol 2003 Part 2 in Jilin, China, because uh, it looks like they're, they're inviting all of our star talent to come on out. <laughs> really a road show. Which is good for them. And uh, perhaps we'll have the opportunity to see part of their conference right. on the web, too. That would be, would that would be, be interesting and exciting. Uh, we're really thrilled to have them because at, when we were planning this conceptually, we said, well, there are certain developed countries, internet developed countries, yes. yeah. where we think we can do this uh, without too much challenge. Of course, Korea is known as the most wired country on right. earth. If, if, if it can be done anywhere, it should be done here. Uh, but we kind of pinpointed two countries where we said it would be neat right. if they could do it. Right. We don't know what their infrastructure is. But we particularly talked to IIT for China as one of our two right. destinations. They came through. The other one we were hoping for, I'd rather not say who they are, but, uh, you know, it's tough. Yeah, it uh, and and, well, and, and Sunday is an issue, too. Well, you know, and, Sunday is a very great time issue. Because, I mean, I, I can think of many teachers in South America who would love to be part of this, but you're talking 12 hours difference. So, you know, it's and, and that's really why yeah. we, we aimed it towards the East Asian Absolutely. market, because there's a certain similarity of, of uh, oh, culture and right. learner in uh, – there's things that are shared that we thought was a good positive first step I think because it, time zone is just so tough to do. No, it is. But, you know, going back to this, the, the, the online project we were talking, research project we were talking about in the context of my talk yesterday, the ICON project, one of the things that was interesting as a step in that project is that after we gathered data where teachers would report from their own countries, then we put them in cross-national groups specifically to look for patterns of activity and as always happens I think when 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 teachers really sort of begin to compare the essence of what what goes on in classrooms they find that sort of the level below the surface is a lot more archetypal mm -hmm. than, than than one might be led to think and because our aim was to identify patterns of activity we wanted to make sure that what a you know a Korean was seeing happening in a Korean classroom how would that square with what a Brazilian was seeing? And in fact, there were many commonalities, many differences as well. It's not to say, you know, we're one big happy family and everybody's the same, but there is a sense in which I think we, it is both good to establish sort of regional identities and in a professional sense also uh, global identities. And I think this technology you're using is, is brilliant in that regard. Well, well thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you're not, um, I don't remember your words, but basically you're not using a lot of technology at a high level in your classrooms. Are you more of a traditional teacher in that way? Well, uh, no, I said I'm personally not as adept with technology as even the rest of my family, my children, for example. Um, 
We don't use a tremendous amount of technology in our face-to-face -face, uh, work in Brattleboro. That said, the institution uses a tremendous amount of technology, and I'll give you two examples. I mentioned the Teacher Knowledge Project, which is a professional development project that relies very heavily on web-based uh, asynchronous conferencing as a key way of delivery. The other is uh, a project called the Global Partnership for Non-Governmental Organizational Development, or NGO Development, which brings together NGOs in the Global South, ranging from Bangladesh to Zimbabwe to Peru, to uh, East Asia, uh, or South Asia, really, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and they function through, again, uh, a, an asynchronous set of web relationships uh, to provide uh, cross-training across NGOs in different parts of the world. Um, it's clear that when the web didn't exist and when it wasn't easy to access, the, the possibility of these types of organizations learning from and profiting from one another's lessons and experiences just wasn't there. It depended on somebody going literally from one place to another. So that in this case, technology has been highly facilitative of that kind of work. So I would not, I would say that, that, that uh, our organization is uh, wired in a well thought out way. Um, we, like most institutions, have limited resources, and we have to think seriously about what we invest in. And I think we've done extremely well in not sort of catching the first wave, which is often the most expensive mm -hmm. and most problematic, exactly. but waiting for the second wave to, to see where it will, will, will lead. Um, we're another example, just to, to bring it sort of closer to home in our department in language teacher education, we're moving to uh, digital portfolios from print portfolios for a number of reasons. They're easier to submit for our students, they're easier to comment on for our faculty, and they're easier to transport on a CD when you're going for a job interview than exactly. to bring in a box. Uh, the interesting thing, though, that I've had some uh, graduates uh, comment on me is when you go to a job interview, depending on who you're being interviewed by... They so may want it in paper. They may want it in paper. So, you know, we're in a transitional environment, but this is what we all know. And, uh, and I think that uh, going back to the question about technology, when it, when it suits, when, when it really helps to reach an end that is commonly sought after, there's, I think it has no parallel. I think uh, the first wave is often of technology is often sort of being seduced by the bells and whistles and missing, you know, missing the point. I mean, we saw that in language education when early on with computers, right. essentially people were just putting ALM right. textbooks on the computer, and it, exactly. it was supposed to look better. But it, well, and it's, it's still out there. Yeah, we exactly. can still find them. Yeah, but there, there are certainly we've we've gone way a lot farther than that in many many instances. We're just wrapping up yeah. uh, the, the last moments of this discussion. Uh, again, we're with Dr. Donald Freeman of the School of International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont. He is uh, a past president of TESOL. He's known for several publications, including the book Doing Teacher Research. And I'd like to ask, what can we look forward from you in the next couple of years? What's, what's in the pipeline? What's in the pipeline? Um, Majorly in the pipeline is this ICON project, which uh, I'm working on with uh, my colleague Kathleen Graves and Linda Lee. It's um, a project which is using a course book as a platform for student learning and professional development and seeing can, is it possible to design a course book that will support teachers learning teaching and students learning language simultaneously. And it's been a fascinating project to be involved in. And it's been very um, positive from our point of view in working with um, a publisher like McGraw-Hill that has the resources when they put it to a project of this magnitude to really do it right. So um, that, that project it will be coming to fruition in the next, um, I would say, 12 to 18 months. Um, and it really is looking, as I said, at the notion of creating tools for professional learning for teachers and language learning for students that, that meet that common ground between classroom management and student participation, sort of gathering the, the, where the two student, uh, circles overlap. Um, at the same time, I'm doing w other work in this whole notion of uh, sociocultural theory as a way of understanding the relationship between professional development, institutional change, and uh, s student learning, and I'll be writing more on that. Um, but those are the two things that are in the pipeline for right now. That's great. Uh, did we have any other questions right up there on, on the top of the line? Oh, we have one from the audience. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, I've just... Uh, a live interview. Uh, you mean a replay of a live? Uh, okay. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, updates on the webcast scene. First is that we had scheduled a replay of the Bruce, uh, Bruce Tomlinson, Barry, Thomas. Barry, Brian. There we go. It's it's sorry. Uh, this is live. The yeah, Brian Tomlinson uh, uh, <laughs> plenary presentation of earlier today, but we're not going to be able to show that immediately. However, we do have a live question and answer session with Dave Sperling coming up in a very few short minutes. Uh, to resummarize what we're doing here today, this is the 11th annual Korea TESOL conference, which is being webcast by Korea Bridges. And if we can back up just a second, you can see Korea Bridge. Excuse me, I got an S in there. KoreaBridge.com. He's going to flash. And yes, it, it, it's it's an, it's a nice T-shirt. Uh, www.koreabridge.com. You know, if we got enough emails asking for T-shirts, maybe we could get the organization to uh, to get them out on the marketplace. And I know they appreciate my instantaneous offer, but uh, you know, they they appreciate your emails and they want to hear from you so they know uh, who's out there and what you want from an internet provider, particularly in the ELT area. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We have our last thanks to Dr. Donald Freeman for participating with us for, for well over the, the time that I'd asked. 45, we're, we're looking at 50 minutes with Dr. Donald That's Freeman. Me. <laughs> a, a, a chat of what he's doing. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate it. it I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing, and, and I'm, I'm uh, pleased to have been part of it. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay.